Hello, good afternoon everyone. Uh, my name is Chelsea O'Brien and I'm one of the curators here at ACME. Firstly, I'd like to pay my respects to the traditional owners on the land in which we are gathered, the people of the Kulin Nation. I pay my respects to their elders past and present and any, elder, any elders who might be with us today. And I'd also like to acknowledge all First Nations people who are here. I'm really delighted to welcome you all this afternoon and of course very thrilled to be here with Jason Fu and his editor Connor who is joining us via Zoom. Jason's work Analects of Kung Fu Book One, The 69 Dialogues Between the Lamp and the Shadow is currently on display downstairs in Gallery 3. His new video work presents us with a guide for surviving contemporary life through the lens of screen-based martial arts narratives and uses a diverse mix of content from film, television, video games, and social media. Jason is a Sydney-born, Melbourne-based artist who explores, whose artworks explores Chinese histories in Australia, his own family history, and Chinese-Vietnamese folklores. His multidisciplinary practice includes printmaking, installation, painting, and video. His work has been shown widely around Australia in a number of major institutions, commercial galleries and artist run spaces. And of course, this year he was the recipient of the Mordant Family Moving Image Commission for Young Artists for his work Analects of Kung Fu. His work is also showing in the way we eat at the Art Gallery of New South Wales. And he was also a part of Rising Festival this year, collaborating on cooked mooncake memories. He is represented by Station Gallery here in Melbourne. His editor, Connor Bateman, is a writer, video editor, video editor film programmer, and managing editor of 4.3, an independent online film magazine. His writing has been published widely in real time, The Lifted Brow, Sense of, Senses of Cinema, and more. And his video work has been screened at QT Gallery, the Monash University Museum of Art. He is also a lead programmer of Static Vision, an independent Australian film collective, and he currently works as the digital and social lead at ABC Arts. And of course, here he is joining us from Zoom right, in Sydney. So. <laughs> hey. hey. Jason and Connor, I'd really like to welcome you here today. Thank you. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Now that you've all heard plenty from me, Jason, can you tell us in your own words, what is the work about? Uh, yeah, it's, uh, I think you explained it pretty well at the start. <laughs> but, uh, um, yeah, I guess it's, um, we jokingly have referred to it and at the, in the credits as a book. So it's basically a book, but it's montages from different Kung Fu films. Um, we have sayings or situations that I've perceived as having some sort of um, wisdom. And so I've compiled them into these different sort of chapters um, as a guideway to life. Yeah, I mean, it's basically what it is. Yeah, <laughs> yeah great. Um, and where did this idea come from? Like, how long have you been kind of thinking about it? For a really long time, actually. Um, yeah, I've got a big cache of cash, cash, cache, cache, cache. Yeah, <laughs> always thought maybe it's pronounced cash, but anyway, cache of ideas. Um, but often, you know, you don't have the time or resources. So this was quite a time heavy, um, plus resource heavy in the sense that uh, I don't have any great editing skills. Um, so Connor's like a master editor. I don't know if that's a term, but yeah, um, really needed his skills. And that came with the grant, um, the commission money sort of thing. So uh, yeah, I think maybe like five years or so, it was in my notes, sort of building on it. But you know, what's ended up now is probably completely different to what I envisaged. But um, to me, this is a growing project. Um, not necessarily by my hand, but maybe someone else might, you know, take another look at it or re-edit it or add to it or something, so. Yeah, yeah, cool. And do you feel like you were subconsciously kind of collecting films in that five years or was it sort of just an idea that you kind of put down and then picked up in earnest? Um, no, not really. I was more jotting down ideas, yeah. maybe aesthetic things. I feel like that would take up too much memory. Um, 
if I was a computer um, <laughs> to store all these things. But quite a few things did come from memory. Um, so things I remembered, but I don't think that was in any particular way. I think if any of us sort of try to remember, you know, things that have stood out to us in movies, I think it wouldn't be that hard. You know? yeah, 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 yeah. They're quite, you know, um, they're quite visually, um, don't know the word, they're things that really stick in your memory. Mm, um, visually movies. arresting or something. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And I mean, Connor, when did you sort of, I mean, you've come to this project later with Jason, but what's your experience of kind of working on the project sort of earlier? Um, yeah, it was, a, it was just a phone call from Jason, really. <laughs> we'd, we'd sort of not worked together before, but been in Prototype, which was an online video art program, their debut program. Jason and I both made works for that. And so we've been aware of each other's <laughs> approach to video and, and the way in which we can reinterpret films in terms of for Jason rethinking them in terms of writing, painting, for me, throwing them into a blender for video. Um, and so when Jason first approached me for this, it was a little daunting because I think the, the first number he told me was he wanted to use 200 films. I think 300. Maybe. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Usually stuff I make on my own, I'm using like 10. So right. it was a tall order. And actually that's a good time to ask. So how many works do you think have made it into the actual final work? I think final count was about 70. Um, yeah. We had 200 titles on the list. So they're movies plus TV shows plus YouTube videos. Um, so yeah, it was a lot of viewing. Yeah, I was <laughs> like, well, I was viewing them 1.6 to two times the speed, skipping back and forth 10 seconds um, at a time. I did try to do two screens at once for a few of them, but yeah, that was pretty exhausting. So I, I just kept it at one screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> and you've also spoken about how the work is or has been influenced by Chinese texts. Can you talk to us about how traditional stories informed Analex, particularly around the idea of kind of this, like, you know, contemporary guide to life in comparison to, say, works of Confucius, et cetera? Yeah, um, I guess uh, those texts, so I guess the core tenets of Chinese culture, you could roughly describe as like Buddhism, Confucianism, Taoism. And they've got their own core texts. Um, uh, obviously, Buddhism's quite a wide-ranging um, religion with a lot of different core texts. And um, different countries follow different texts as well. But uh, for Confucianism, it'd be the Analects, and then, which is what the title of this is drawn from. And for Taoism, it'd be the Tao Te Ching. So yeah, I mean, they're really great texts. Um, yeah, I've, I've read them and I guess I've found sort of wisdom in them, but yeah, you're often unsure because they're things that were written, you know, a thousand years ago sort of thing, you know, well, not literally, but, um, <laughs> and they were for a very different time and, you know, obviously wisdom does, you know, it's still, um, stuff that's written back then still applies today, but things are very different now and um, you often question, I guess, whether something sounds really good or is actually really good. And mm -hmm. um, I think, um, you know, whether we're smarter or wiser, we're maybe a lot more educated in this day and age or at least have more access to a lot more information and many different layers of things. Doesn't necessarily mean we're, you know, um, better able to cope with life, but um, it is a very, very different world to back then, I think. So, yeah, I forgot what your question was, but. That's okay. <laughs> um, I mean, I think we were talking about sort of the influence of those sorts of texts on the work, but what you've said is really fascinating. I, I think also the structure of them. Yeah, so, sure. um, the 69 chapters is a reference to, there's 71 chapters in the Tao Te Ching. And I thought 69 was just a funny number. You know? <laughs> um, uh, and 
yeah, the dialogues are because it is a conversation between two people or one person by themselves. Um, Chan Buddhist dialogues from like the 13th century to the 17th century. Um, they're generally in a dialogue format, so they're a conversation between a master and a pupil. So that's just a very normal format to present um, books in. So yeah, that's why I sort of had this idea of this back and forth, yeah. Yeah, it's really nice how the work kind of, there's moments where it, it seems like it's really a dialogue back and forth. And then there's other moments when you're wondering, is this just one person kind of um, ruminating on their own ideas? Or is this just Jason like having a complete joke with us all yeah. or things like that? Yeah, I think when you read the texts, um, you know, the most revered texts from like the 13th, 14th century, they're, some of them are just complete nonsense. <laughs> and a lot of the texts you're like, well, this person seems to, you know, have some serious mental health issues or something, you know, right. like, or going through some sort of psychosis or something, you know. Um, that's not, uh, um, that's not uncommon, I'd say, across cultures. I completely forgot to look it up, but was it Greek or Roman, the lady who was an oracle and then... The Oracle they, Delphi. Oracle Delphi. So she was on top of the mountain and they went to ask her advice and modern archaeologists are like, oh, that's where all the sulfur came out of. So she must have just been really high <laughs> and saying nonsense. And I often wonder about that with um, our older texts whether we've drawn meaning, um, you know, it's a very human thing to um, draw meaning from patterns in nature, from things happening. Um, we're seeing that now with um, COVID and the rise of QAnon, you know, drawing these meanings from these symbols and things. And um, yeah, it's not that I'm saying, you know, Lao was compatible with uh, QAnon, <laughs> but um, it's, just a, it's just a very human thing to draw um, patterns from these things. And you're like, oh, what, what is real, what is not? Yeah. Um, obviously, you got to apply these things to your life and then um, see what is most useful and what is you know, good for people and society, so yeah. yeah. And what was the process? Like how, did you, like, how did you work together? How did you kind of? I think the start was, yeah, I, I'd contact uh, Connor, um, we were just trying to source the film, so Connor did a really great job. Um, uh, he's got a really good knowledge of where archival material could exist. Um, there's a lot of films we couldn't find because they probably literally exist in a film reel somewhere. Um, yeah, I mean, Connor, yeah, what was the process? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, the research process was yeah, you coming to me with, with several lists that were drawn from, you know, films your father had told you about or things that you had found online or related films, like sequels. There's a lot of films that are used in the work that are rip-offs, sequels, spin-offs. And so part of the research process for this work was figuring out how many of them we wanted. Because I think there definitely needed to be some pattern beyond just actors, I guess. Um, but yeah, so that was the, the early thing. But in terms of working together, I mean, all hail the Google Doc, right? Um, <laughs> it was, it, we had this mammoth Google Doc that um, at a certain point, Jason would just fill out with the text. So we would have each scene or chapter. Um, I, think, I think there's actually 71, but there's only 69 that are actually dialogues. There's an intermission, there's an introduction. Um, and yeah, he would write down, here's the film I want for a title card, here's the film I want for the scene, here's roughly the time codes, and here's the text. And so going from that was trying to make it fit <laughs> on a, on a, within, within a scene and also within a broader structure. So it was good. It was, you know, I think Jason would say it was as well as a bit of a sprint. Um, and we were probably in a fugue state as we were making it. But, yeah. Yeah, so Connor's also got his own artistic practice um, where he makes montage films um, that draw literally kind of what I was talking about, drawing patterns um, from things that repeat themselves. And I definitely did notice this through watching all these films. It's, there's just common things that happen 
throughout every film, um, like a story arc or um, archetypes or whatever. But yeah, he's definitely got the skill set to quickly splice movies that are from completely different genres, different qualities, different sounds, like together. So it made the process a lot easier because it's pretty hard when something ends in a big bang to go to a really gentle scene suddenly, you know, that's not what we we as viewers are used to um, seeing in a movie, so yeah. Yeah, one of the things that I really love about the work and I've spoken to you about before is the fact that you actually see the same performer, performers again and again, like across their career or in different sequences and it's, it's kind of, I don't know, you find yourself getting lost in kind of all of the different genres and different narratives. Yeah, I mean, it wasn't even just the actors, it was um, similar characters or literally the same character, so... Yeah, that's right. So this scene is from Drunk Drunken Master, which is the first one that came out. And then you've got um, a completely different movie and storyline, um, Snake in the Eagle Shadow, where they're the same, it's Jackie Chan and I forgot the actor of the master um, uh, who teaches him but they're just dressed the same. <laughs> and then the master is uh, played by a young person in different subsequent films as well. So yeah, they're just this constant repetition. And people have appeared from their first roles to their last role. So Gordon Liu, who's a really famous actor, um, people probably recognize, unless you're, if you're a big uh, fan of all the Wu-Tang um, films, you'd know him, but um, I guess he's, I'm not sure if it was his last role, but most recent one I remember was the Kill Bill. He was the um, Master Pai um, with the big long white beard. So, oh, that one there, yeah. <laughs> um, so he appears from his first role to his last role sort of thing. Yeah, he recently passed away, so yeah. And so what about your experiences <clears throat> growing up watching Kung Fu as kids? Like, do you, do you kind of come from a similar starting point from that respect or? Was one of you a really big fan and one of you less so? Connor, are you shaking your head? <laughs> I think we're, we're the same-ish age, or the same age. Um, I don't think I watch Kung Fu films more than any other kid from any other culture. I think most of my, I'd say it's very rare I met, I've met someone who's like, I never watched a Kung Fu film as a kid. They're just cool, you know, they were the, they were like Marvel before Marvel existed sort of thing. So, you know, everyone loves action, fighting, hitting things, you know, even if you grow out of it, yeah. I don't know about you, Connor, if you had a particular interest or not. No, I don't think I, I still haven't seen a heap of them. I think, I think, you know, growing up it was the Western reinterpretations of, of them, thinking about like uh, Kung Pao, Enter the Fist, which we quote in the middle, middle of this work. Um, or the Kill Bill films, or the sort of the films that broke through and had huge theatrical success, or success over here, like Kung Fu Hustle, the Stephen Chow films, um, like which are more comedies. But I mean, I think that film in particular made quite an impression on me when I was younger. The more serious ones that have broken through would be, um, I guess, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon as well. Um, so it's kind of funny in that one. I think. I'm not sure if it's Australia, but it's probably an American reaction um, to people flying. And everyone's like, how can, you know, the film was great, but these people are flying and that's not realistic. But it's the wuxia genre was the, um, uh, I'm going to keep saying Marvel because it's like everyone knows Marvel, but the Marvel of ancient China, you know, um, where everyone had superpowers. So you don't watch a Marvel film and go, why is that guy green and big now? You know, you're like, oh, that makes sense. You know, um, so them flying is part of that ancient storytelling genre, which was, um, you know, formed part of our culture, but was also just entertainment. You know, it's cooler when people can resist swords with their fists and um, fly around and you know dodge arrows, a hundred thousand arrows or whatever. So, yeah, yeah. Um, can you tell us about the importance of kind of writing the script and like how that kind of informed the scenes that you chose sort of moving forward? Yeah, I think that was more of a time thing. Um, yeah, I did want to watch like 300 films, but I think watching, I watched maybe like 20 and was writing down every single quote and then, yeah, just trying to compile something from that 
Um, yeah, it would have taken a, I reckon, five years or so. Um, so like Connor says, he, he watches like maybe 10 films for his video works, but he watches them at normal speed in full multiple times, like sitting down watching them sort of thing. So um, yeah, it was a bit, I think you, you mentioned it earlier, it was like a bit of reverse engineering. Um, I kind of knew what I was looking for, or I compiled the sayings very quickly, or the 10 seconds skipping ahead um, at the two times speed was to quickly mine, what I'd call mine, um, for things that were being said very quickly. Um, so yeah, it became a process of gathering information and formulating a rough narrative um, very quickly to sort of fit within the time frame of the project, yeah. Yeah, it's a pretty um, incredible yeah. undertaking that you both have uh, achieved really. Like our commissioning programs usually are what, six months, eight months. So to have a 85 minute work developed in a short amount of time is really huge. So it's extremely impressive. I think Connor put it, like we, we work obviously for a few months, but Connor put it together in a rough edit in about two weeks. So wow. we're working together, yeah. As, uh, you can tell me that now. Yeah, you yeah. can tell me that at the time, I would have been worried, but. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and the other thing that I've noticed whilst watching the work is that you seem to return, you sort of mentioned this before, you return to sort of narratives or stories um, in different kind of iterations. So you might see, um, for example, the story, the, the monkey narrative is obviously one that you have a few different version of, versions of, whether they be a cartoon or a YouTube clip. Um, what sort of attracts you to this story in particular or what kind of, why do you keep returning? Um, I don't think it's necessary just me. Like monkey, um, which people probably know as monkey magic, is based on a text Journey to the West. It's one of the four um, core fictional texts of like ancient and like current China. So it's got other texts like the Three Kingdoms. Um, but um, it is like the most, I'd say the most popular text in China. So there are, yeah, there's, I reckon there's 10 different strands of movies, um, multiple cartoons, um, things people might not even know, like Dragon Ball, the whole series, um, the main character is sort of based on um, Monkey, um, and there's, you know, offshoot characters that come in through. So it's just a really popular text, and it just appears in a lot of media, and um, it's popular because it's fun as well. <laughs> uh, even though it was written, you know, hundreds of years ago, it's still a really fun and interesting text to read. So. I think it's just because, yeah, it's just fun. And things like um, like Drunken Fist or Drunken Boxing, which comes from the Drunken, uh, ma not doesn't come from, which Drunken Master is based on, are just more popular forms of um, fighting uh, in the genre, just because it's interesting, because there's a lot of, um, most martial arts is, are based on different animal movements. So you've got snake, crane, monkey. But the drunken one is, I think it crosses over in interest with, um, you know, Chinese audience, but a Western audience as well. It's like, oh, it's based on a drunk guy. You know? <laughs> so um, if you don't know, it's, it's um, copying the forms of a drunken person moving and using hidden sort of movements because you're feigning weakness and then moving back and forth. So um, yeah, it's just, I think it's just what most people are interested in and it's just what was available, so yeah. The other one that um, features quite heavily in the work is of course Havoc in Heaven, yeah. which you watched as a kid, right? Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah that, that's, I'd highly recommend going to view it. Um, it's Havoc in Heaven, I think it's 1961. Um, Connor, I don't know if you remember, but it's on YouTube, you can watch the whole thing. Um, it's, yeah, it's pretty interesting because a lot of those um, cartoons I grew up with were made after the Civil War and pre-Cultural Revolution. Um, there was like a, this little golden era of animation. Um, so Havoc in Heaven, I, I view as like the sort of Fantasia of sort of, is that what it's called? The yeah, Disney yeah, thing? Yeah, yeah of, of China. It's just a beautiful film. Um, 
Yeah, I love those old uh, animations. And so f I think it's one of the first times they used a rotoscope. So they weren't, it was at the time advancements in um, technology um, for animation, but they weren't hand drawing every single frame. And it was like having backgrounds and being able to zoom in and out. So those things probably took, you know, years off the animation, even though it took three years, I think 300 animators to, to make it. So yeah, right. yeah, it's just a beautiful film. Yeah. Um, and your practice, within your practice, you often explore language and translation, specifically around your own experiences of growing up speaking Chinese, but then learning to read and write it sort of later. Can you talk us through your approach to the subtitles in Analex and the mistranslation that regularly occurs in martial arts narratives? Yeah, I mean, there's a few different layers to this. So in my, so I was born here, um, Mandarin and English were both my first language. Um, uh, I've since lost a huge chunk of my vocabulary just because um, I don't use it as much here. I try to speak with my mom and dad as often, but you know, growing up, it'd be more of like, oh, it's for dinner. It's like, <laughs> oh, cool, rice again, you know. <laughs> um, but it's, uh, I still speak it fluently, but when I translate for my 2D works, I'll, you know, I, I do this quite intuitively. There's not a massive conceptual reason to which one I pick, but it will either be what I say and translate into calligraphy or I'll just uh, straight up Google translate a text. Um, and for me, that um, loss in translation or the loss in meaning is uh, more truthful to how I speak because of my sort of, I reckon I've got a, like a year six vocabulary maybe um, with Mandarin. But then sometimes I work with my mom to translate and it's like a bit of a battle because um, <laughs> you know she'll be like, that's grammatically incorrect. That's not how you say those things. or that's how a child say, says things. <laughs> so, yeah, I'll say poo and penis like a child says. Because <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, the yeah. last time I learnt those words. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so it's got that level which is um, sort of inherent to myself. But with mistranslation, the other layer is that cultural texts and religious texts, and this is across all cultures, um, the authorship is um, often unknown or it's multiple authors, you know, from the Bible to the Analex. Um, and even the translations of these things um, are completely lost every time they get retranslated or even just reprinted by um, a printing company. So there's that interest as well in that, you know, we often sub subscribe, ascribe, anyway, I'm losing all my words today. <laughs> authorship of these texts to this single mystical person mm. um, that we don't even know if they really existed but in reality they're compiled by a lot of different people and you know there's whole wars fought on um, you know how we interpret certain religious texts and you know people interpret them in completely opposite ways so it sort of it's not me dispelling the importance of these texts but it's like well if people were interpreting them in any way they want, a sentence or two, then what are these texts really? Yeah, are they yeah, yeah. important or should we, you know, just be good to each other? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the translations as well, movies and Connor can probably talk a bit more about this is, yeah, I mean, when I watch, because I have to use English subtitles for Chinese movies, but I still speak it fluently. So I still got most of my vocabulary I'll just see that it's just wrong. Mm. Um, and I think most recently um, it came about on Squid Game. There was a famous TikToker who was like, this is all wrong. They've translated everything wrong. Why have they done this? But it's always happened because it's a third party that sort of does it. And um, Connor, what did you say? It was the Squid Game one, there was a particular thing where it was... Oh, the Squid Game one I think was a slight misunderstanding yeah. because they Netflix provided closed caption subtitles in English, which is direct transcription of the dub, and also English subtitles that were translated. And I think a lot of people clicked English CC instinctively, which is going to be very, very far off what is literally being said in the original Korean. Um, yeah, so as a but, big fan of yeah. anime, um, I always try and use the 
subs, subtitles and just have the original voices because the English is often yeah. wrong. So it was a translation of English. But it's, it's interesting because sometimes the translations are just the opposite. Or, I mean, I feel like most of us, there's quite a few young people here, um, grew up with, you know, um, fake DVDs and VCDs where you'd get just some different movies, subtitles with your film and you're like well this is really shit because I don't understand what this film's saying so even that's a quite a funny thing where you just um, would get that and you'd be like well I just have to watch it now because I don't have the internet doesn't exist yet you know so yeah and just while we're on subtitles the yellow you chose to use yellow yeah I didn't realize um Connor had to educate me on this I was like oh I'll use that you know the common yellow subtitle but um, yeah, Connor, you, you know exactly the history of this and how it's viewed well, overseas. Yeah. Yeah. I was just, when, last year I made a, a thing with a documentarian, Sari Braithwaite, um, that's here at Acme called You Will See Me. And there's a few clips we used in that work that are not in English. And we chose to subtitle those clips in different visual ways. So one of them is a copy of SBS. One of them is a copy of a high-end DVD. One of them is how it would look like on Netflix. Um, and of course, the SBS one looks the best because I think all of us are used to watching non-English language films on SBS. So when Jason, um, you know, when we started putting the subtitles into this work, I, as soon as Jason said, oh yeah, maybe yellow, I was like, we are getting as close as possible to SBS. <laughs> I am taking time this afternoon. It, to, to make people think it's exactly SBS. It's not, it's, <laughs> it's slightly off, but good enough to fool most people, I think. Oh no, I meant like, um, it, it's, I didn't realize it's a SBS thing that is not used anywhere around the world. Yeah, and that yeah. when SBS, I guess now people just export films over the internet, whatever, but when as people watching SBS films overseas with the subtitles, it's a it's a thing. People are like, oh, that's people overseas are like, that's an Australian. It's like a calling card. Yeah, yeah, and no, I I just well, find it really. The yellow is so legible. Yeah, mm. it's yeah. so clean, it's so clear. It's it's yellow. It's light yellowy green text with a very thin black stroke outline around it. Um, but what you were saying, Jason, then about this, how it became a calling card. That's because in the <coughs> '90s, I guess SBS had just we're airing a lot more film than most publicly funded broadcasters in the world, um, particularly non-English language film. And so now when you have films that are impossible to find, never came out on DVD, never, um, if you're able to find them, and so someone has ripped a VHS, those subtitles, the SBS yellow, will be hard-coded onto them. So that form of subtitling has almost become synonymous with hard to find non-English language films. Yeah, it's such a fascinating history. Um, and speaking of kind of the additional text that's on the work, and I'm hoping the next one, that's a pretty great one. Uh, you've included a lot of illustrative calligraphic cards and drawings um, across overlaid across the work. Can you talk a little bit further about the meanings and also just tell us about how these were done? Yeah, I mean, um, for anyone that's watched a slightly older Kung Fu film, or I think they, they exist now, but these title cards do just pop up with um, uh, calligraphy on it. It used to be done with bits of glass that they did the calligraphy on. But I just used Procreate and then I f sort of fake made a calligraphy brush, which um, for anyone that actually practices calligraphy, they'd be like, oh, this is not well done. <laughs> you know, the weight, the weight and the strength of the line is so important with traditional calligraphy. So, yeah, they're just things that appear. This actually is a particular example of just me having a little bit of fun um, <laughs> because this is a few different layers of meanings was... Um, uh, the, there's Taoist... Um, talismans sort of look like this as well so they're made with these symbols but also it's a reference back to um, language being used because the next um, few chapters after this use bone oracle text 
So Bone Oracle text was the original, well, the oldest surviving um, example of written language in China that we have, which is uh, from the Bronze Era. Wow. So they were literal, like, um, they're called Bone Oracle because they were inscribed on ox scapula and um, turtle shells, I think, yeah. Um, and yeah, they, they literally look like pictures, but when you look at the development of um, the Chinese language, it's pretty obvious where it's come from. So the symbol for home originally was a, like, it was like a square with a pig in it because originally you lived with your livestock. Yeah, right. So it's like, oh, a pig in under thing is your home. So yeah, pig home, yeah. And the pig, Piggy appears in the scene after this as well, so. Yeah, he's another character yeah. that appears <clears throat> quite a bit, which is very fun. Um, speaking of uh, pig, the work features a number of sequences where people are eating and sharing meals. Um, and of course, Jason, you've just opened your restaurant in North Melbourne. And in your practice Monday, general- it's in North <laughs> Melbourne. Mauritian food, it's really great. Go, go check it out, yeah. yeah. Manze, yeah, yeah. I'm not Mauritian, but the head chef is, yeah. Mauritian, yeah. I'm Mauritian, I read Oh, yeah, you should, uh, you should drop in, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I'm, I'm not cooking in the kitchen. <laughs> yeah. um, but you often return to food in your yeah. work. Um, can you talk more about food generally, but also like the importance of sharing food in your work? Yeah, I mean, it's not, it's not a Chinese thing. I think it's a worldwide thing. Food is just the core of all society and family, you know, sort of thing. So, uh, but in particular in Chinese culture, obviously it's very important, um, home and food, but also I guess even like medicinally, like, um, I guess not, this is a very basic sort of uh, understanding of Chinese medicine, but Chinese medicine isn't about like, oh, we'll wait till you're sick and then we'll get you to cure. It's everything you do is part of, your, your body's constantly degrading. It's part of, you heal yourself every single day with every single action. So even the meals you eat, what you drink every day is about, um, again, a very basic breakdown, but yin yang, hot, cold foods and balancing that out, if you feel slightly sick about rebalancing your diet um, instantly and your movements through life and what you're drinking and stuff. So it plays through into sort of, um, yeah, culture, medicine, um, yeah, just every part, every uh, facet of sort of Chinese culture. So yeah, and it's just, it's fun to eat and <laughs> yeah. with friends and family and it's just like, I. It's probably the greatest joy in my life is to just eat with friends and what else is there to do, you know? That's, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's the only reason we work and make money is to buy more food to eat with each other. <laughs> yeah. That was fantastic. <laughs> yeah. um, we might throw it open to some questions from the audience if there are any. Um, if you want to just ask the question, I will repeat it just so Connor can hear it. Yes? Okay. Just watch a little bit before not coming to here. Um, so I, I had a lot of fun watching it. I never had fun like watching video. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's a that's a big compliment. <laughs> yeah, I have, I've been laughing because yeah. I think from the subtitle mostly because some of the scenes the subtitle is like really funny. Uh, if you if you can understand like uh, Chinese, so I want to ask why do you who the subtitles would you have? Like, concern that um, people might not understand like, when you see the subtitle and the original sound is different. Yeah. So that question, Connor, was just about the difference between um, what's being said kind of through the film itself versus the subtitling. And also, uh, he was also saying that he had lots of fun watching downstairs. Um, yeah, nice. it's a, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Really great question. Uh, it comes up quite a lot. Um, I guess the more prominence I gain in Australia as an artist using Chinese words, um, I get questioned that a lot. But for me, it's, it's, you know, artworks always exist in many different layers. And, you know, um, 
from the bottom up, I guess, like there's a very, very, very personal layer that's just for me that none of you could ever understand because we all have our own experiences in life, you know. We can never fully understand someone else. So you've got that, but then you've got, you know, language, even if I use English, not everyone has those language skills and um, using Chinese is like, okay, if you understand that bit, then you get those different layers, you know. Um, my parents would understand the work in a completely different way because, um, you know, English isn't their first language. But even, it's not even, it's even beyond languages. If you didn't really grow up with Kung Fu films, you just really wouldn't get a lot of it as well. So there's just always these layers. And then, you know, when we go to see artworks with calligraphy, um, we, you know, we're often like, oh, that's really beautiful. We don't really need to understand it. But understanding that creates another level. But even calligraphy, some forms of calligraphy in Chinese painting are unreadable. Or often they'll use bone oracle text or older, um, uh, older um, variations of the language. So, yeah, it's sort of an easier way to say that, you know, everyone has a different experience with everything. In saying that, um, I do, for most of my artworks, try and provide some level of um, translation, whether it's in the war text or, um, I mean, it's why we're lucky that this is very normal these days to um, have interviews um, and to be able to sort of even have access to the artists in a way. Um, yeah, it's, it's yeah. That, that was, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> that was yeah. great. Was there any other questions? Okay. Yes. Uh, yeah, this whole installation was great. I saw a bit of it when I watched it afterwards in full, but... It's um, one and a half hours, so I don't yeah. expect you to sit <laughs> through the whole thing. Yeah. Um, you were doing the Russian restaurant. I'm a Russian guy. I've been yeah. to China twice. Yeah. I love the Wutai clan and just ended up yeah. practicing Kung Fu. And yeah. Show and yeah. train. And I just wondered with the whole Kung Fu, if you could tell your message with any type of Asian cinema, yeah. or if it was just aesthetically Kung Fu, or even if you ever did it, or it was something about the actual physical practice of Kung Fu? All oh, right, yeah. I mean, I've done like multiple martial arts, but very, very basically. So, um, Mum put me in Kung Fu classes. Actually, we've got, I've got the poster. All right. Hang on, I'm going to skip to it. Just. There we go. That's me in Beijing, um, actually, um, with my cousin next to me, uh, not enjoying the. Uh, that that was karate, I think. Oh, I forgot what it was. Yeah, yeah. I've done judo and kendo, um, some boxing and stuff as well. So, I have a little bit of that experience, but not anymore. Like, that's the thing I really wanted with this is not to have, um, you know. Uh, Chinese Kung Fu is Chinese Kung Fu, it's owned by the Chinese people, but I didn't want to have any ownership over a lot of these films and, you know, we all grew up with them um, and I like that everyone has access to them. Um, obviously, I will inherently know a little bit more about things because I am Chinese and um, grew up with this culture, but yeah, I really like the accessibility of Kung Fu films because most people have watched them. Um, Kung Fu films are known to have these wise sayings and I feel like a lot of people even live their lives subconsciously, unconsciously, sort of with these sayings um, in these films. Uh, and I, I was just interested in that as well because it's like some of them do come from actual, you know, wisdom or texts or religious texts that do exist, but some of them were like writers came up with them or maybe the actors just like improvise them. So, and then They've now entered the genre from 19 whatever, 60 whatever, to now, and now, you know, we're even unsure whether it's like, is that actually Chinese wisdom, or is that a writer back then who wrote it, and now it's entered that sort of yeah. So I don't want to ask any questions, but yeah. can I ask if you have a favourite? Because my mine is hero. Yeah. And I was explaining to a friend that this actually has kind of historical context, and I was explaining I was fascinated with the whole unification of China and how it was woven into the story and, and I, was, I was so happy to see it in your piece. Hero is an interesting one because I, I saw it with um, my cousin in China um, who's from, who's born in uh, and lives in Beijing and yeah my, my cousin, my uncle thought it was a crap film. <laughs> when I saw it I was like whoa this is sick you know the Kung Fu is sick in this. I think I was about 
10 or something um or maybe 12 or something but yeah i thought it was awesome they were like it's like a crappy perfume ad because there's just all these <laughs> scenes where they're floating it's really vivid colors um looking back at it now i can see both sides because i've re-watched it again um actually in full uh, i love the music and a lot of the fight sequences but there were some bits where it was just very like why are they floating around you know <laughs> with these garments yeah uh i i think havoc in heaven just because I grew up with that, um, in uh, uh, mum would take me to, uh, I think we can say this now, like a legal VHS shop <laughs> um, in Campsie, which doesn't exist now, so they're not going to get in trouble. Um, and yeah, we rented that and some other cartoons, but I think I had the comic a as well. But the Drunken Master series, I love them. But yeah, I, I, I love all of them, even the interpretations, which... You know, we haven't, we don't have to fully go into this, but, you know, um, in a really good way, the current conversations about appropriation and um, colonization, they actually play out in a lot of the films, but um, interpret, you know, sort of mockery interpretations of Chinese Kung Fu, but um, that are in the films. I've tried to actually use some of them for me. Yeah, it's about mining the sort of broad spectrum of the history. Um, in a responsible um, way that, uh, well, what I feel like was a responsible way that was sort of um, aware of what audiences might be viewing it as well. So, yeah, but that's a that's a really big, long conversation. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Connor, did you have any favourite martial arts films? No, <laughs> I think um, I think I've seen think all I've the good ones. I've seen like four films in the whole world. I think there was like a decision we made or I made pretty early on that I wasn't going to watch them so that the work would be like, I didn't want to put any interpretation on the films myself. And it was purely, you know, responding to Jason's words and Jason's selections, which I think you know, helped considering the timeline, but also I think made a much more clean work and an interesting work. But yeah, I've only seen like The Matrix, Kill the Lawyer 2, Kung Fu Hustle, Kung Pao, I think that's probably it from the world. Yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I don't know what I was going to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Do we have any other questions from the audience? Okay, good, because then I can get a few more of mine in. Yes. Um, so you sort of mentioned this at the beginning, but I'm interested in what you were talking about with the notion that the work might evolve or you might develop it further? Yeah, I mean, it's, I guess it was what I was talking about at the start, that um, these uh, religious texts um, had multiple authors and evolved over time. So, yeah, depending, you know, I'm sure there's some people who wouldn't like to touch it, but also it's I've taken other people's films without their permission um, and put it in the public domain, um, completely changing things. So I feel like it would be, yeah, it wouldn't be fair of me to say no one can take my work and just completely redo it. Um, obviously, uh, yeah, I'd, if they did, it'd be great if it was for, you know, not to mock um, <laughs> Kung Fu <laughs> films or to make a mockery of things. Um, but to do what sort of I, I, n I never thought this was going to be a religious text that was people were going to actually use, but to make something that people might find useful, entertaining or funny. Um, yeah, that's why I've put book one, you know, there, there might be book two, book three. Um, I don't know if Connor will want to work on them. Um, <laughs> maybe we've had a longer timeline, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, it, it'd be great if you know someone wanted to take it up and do it, or I might do it for another exhibition or something. So, yeah. The sequel. Yeah, the sequel. <laughs> yeah, and the, the sequel is such a common thing in movies. So yeah. Yeah, it's, you almost have to do it. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Any more questions? Yes. Yeah. Uh, what's your parents' attitude towards the? I know, you can ask them. They're right behind you. My parents, they are like, bullshit. They forbid me to watch too, too many as a kid. Well, actually, there's, uh, it's funny you say that. So Connor said, what's uh, your parents' attitude to the films? And my parents forbid me to watch a lot of these 
<laughs> sort of bullshit films, which plays into what, you know, a lot of people thought this were like really wise, awesome films, but, you know, they were, again, the marvel of their time, a lot of these Hong Kong um, Shaw Brother films, they're awesome, I love them, but just saying that, you know, a lot of them were entertainment. You know? Sure. Um, but, yeah, it's funny you said your parents forbid you to because my dad didn't let me watch The Simpsons until I was 10. My dad didn't either. It's, oh my it's, gosh. it's, it's in this, um, it's, it's in here. Uh, and the first episode he let me watch, he was like, okay, I'll sit down and watch it with you, was when Bart steals from the mall. And he was like, see, <laughs> this is why I, I said we can't, you can't watch The Simpsons because he's going to start stealing from the mall. So, yeah. Um, that, yeah, yeah, well, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, because in Kung Fu, we Chinese people believe that you are master and you learn from master. So yeah. it's funny, we respect elder people and master is wise people. So uh, it may be offensive, but say Simpson, yeah. to his way and not everyone. That's why I don't want him to do. So Kung Fu, Kung Fu's fine because of the master, but Simpsons. Kind of, did you hear that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No. So then Kung Fu, the master. You know, you follow the master and you learn a lot. And then in the Simpsons, Bart just does whatever he wants. He's but in a lot of the films, in a lot of the films, the disciples just go, I don't even care what you're saying. I'm gonna just do whatever I want. And everyone ends up happily ever after. So, so there you go. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. yeah. But, well, that might be a really fantastic way to end us with the talk today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, everyone, for coming, for coming in. Guys. Yeah. And yeah, please do go downstairs and spend more time with the work. It is incredibly engaging, funny, and evocative. So thanks again, and have a wonderful thanks, weekend. Connor. Thanks, Connor. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, Ryan.